First of all, thank you uh, for coming. This is going to be the first of two pedagogical lectures all about large deviations, serious large deviations. And it's all about one object, which is the Wiener sausage. And I will explain to you what that is, why that is important, and what we know about the Wiener sausage. Now, these slides are on the website of ICTS, so you, uh, you can sort of scroll back uh, uh, as you want to sort of look at uh, all the definitions. As I go on, I will try to go back and forth a little bit with the slides, but there's a, I mean, time is always pointing into the positive direction, so, uh, so it will give you an opportunity to look at the slides uh, uh, also backwards. So the object that we're interested in is the Wiener sausage. So what you do is you take a Brownian motion on RD. So this is a very basic uh, process. And then at every point of the Brownian motion, you put a sphere of radius 1. So you are thickening up the Brownian motion. And when you do that, you get what is called the Wiener sausage. So the Wiener sausage is the one environment of a Brownian motion up to and including time t. And that is a very interesting process as I will try to convince you about. I'm picking here radius 1. I could pick any other radius r, positive and finite. That doesn't matter. By Brownian scaling, all the results that you have for radius 1, you can transfer them to some other radius. So, so that is not, uh, not an issue. And we're going to stick for easiness with uh, the ball of radius 1. So the Wiener sausage is just the one environment of a Brownian path up to time t. And this is clearly a set that increases uh, over time. And it's a random set because the Brownian motion path is random. Now, in the first lecture, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about this object, some basic facts. I will recall a uh, law of large numbers and central limit theorems that are associated with several quantities uh, that you can, several functionals of the, this Wiener sausage. And then uh, I will focus on, uh, on two large deviation principles, and the large deviation principles will depend on the dimension. Dimension is a very uh, important and significant parameter here. And these uh, LDPs uh, come from work that I did with Michiel van den Berg from Bristol and Erwin Bolthausen from Zurich. Some of it is in the past, some of it is going on, and some of it will be, will be in the future. So I, I hope to, uh, to explain that to you uh, uh, at an easy point. And then tomorrow, I will go back to these large deviation principles and sketch proof of these large deviation principles. And the proof is difficult, uh, and it's based on uh, something that we have called the skeleton approach. So it's some discretization of the Brownian motion, but it's not the discretization that you get by putting the Brownian motion on a, on a lattice. So uh, that means approximating Brownian motion by, by a simple random walk. That, that is not the way we're doing it. We're, we're, we're doing a discretization in another way. And the reason why we do that is that will allow us to bring in some very standard large deviation principles for, for Markov chains that we can then good, put to good use to study the large deviations of the Wiener sausage, because the Wiener sausage is a much more delicate object to play with. OK, and uh, again, this will be really going into the details of the proof, but I, I think it is, uh, it is worthwhile doing that. I, uh, tomorrow I will go slow and I will explain the various step to you, but I think it's um, interesting to do that because in this proof we will encounter lots of tools and tricks that are very typical for large deviations. Certainly, large deviations associated with Brownian motion and problems. Uh, so, so these tools are, are useful uh, also uh, for 
other questions you might ask about maybe putting brown emotion in a in a disordered system that that, that we have been talking about you know there, there there are there are many possibilities and and that as you will see will also be related to what francis was talking about on on uh, on monday and so he's been talking about the discrete version of the Wiener sausage and, and is, is working on a continuum uh, version too. So there, there's a whole bunch of tools out there that are very useful, interesting, powerful, and they will come. I will come to talk to, uh, about them in, in the second lecture. So that is uh, what we're going to do. Let me begin and start to begin by telling you about facts and things that we know uh, from, from the literature, and then uh, eventually I will be ending up, ending up with the large deviation principle that will be the focus of, of these lectures. So let's look a bit more carefully at this definition. So again, I repeat, we are starting with a brown emotion on RD, D can be any integer dynamics. So this is the continuous time marker process on this Euclidean space with the generator delta, that is the Laplacian. I am not using one half delta, I'm using delta. So it's actually standard Brownian motion moving at twice the speed, but never mind, it's, I want to carry the factor half around. And I'm going to use symbol to describe the law of this brown emotion. Uh, under it that the brown emotion has started at the point. We don't put it's that I could start at zero, so the standard case. And then again, what is this Wiener sausage? The Wiener random set and it is just the one environment of the piece of the brown emotion between and you can do for any time t and this clearly is a growing set and it's a random set and if you draw a picture of it it would look something like this so in here is the brown emotion and and what this brown emotion does it's dragging around a ball of radius one and i look at time t, what this is all touched. That is what the set is about. The name Wiener Sausage comes from Mark Katz. So in a 1974 paper, he coined this term, uh, which is, a, a, I think, quite a nice, uh, a nice and funny term. And Mark Katz was also some, a person who was very lively and, and, and you love to do these things. Yesterday I, I learned from uh, Francis that there's also something like a Wiener moustache. I, I, I didn't know that, but who knows what is out there? And the Wiener sausage is here. And uh, so, the, so the, the, the name came in around that time. Actually, uh, the, 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 the first uh, significant research on the object <laughs> occurred a little earlier, as we will see in the early 1960s, Frank Spitzer proved something about this object, but he didn't use the name uh, Wiener Sausage. Okay, so this is the, all going to talk about this object. That's the only suspect in these uh, two lectures. Now, why is the Wiener Sausage important? First of all, uh, it is one of the simplest examples of a non-Markovian functional of Brown motion. So Brown motion itself is is Markovian, but the Wiener sausage is not, because the way the Wiener sausage will grow will depend on its past, because it may self-intersect. It typically will self-intersect. So um, it is therefore a, 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 a really interesting object of, of this very basic process, uh, our, our Brown motion. And it has been used in, in, in a couple of uh, uh, problems coming from, uh, from various areas. So if you want to understand how heat flows uh, in inside or outside a set, uh, 
then, uh, then the Wiener sausage very often appears as a key tool in understanding that flow. So you could take a body in space, you can heat it up, and then you can say, how is it cooling down because it's, it's radiating uh, uh, heat to, to, to the outside world. And if you want to describe that, uh, then, then very often somehow the Wiener sausage top pops up as, as something that you have to describe. The heat conduction, of course, the link with heat conduction comes from the Brownian motion. And this one environment comes that you have to deal with spatialness of the, of the heat content. Then, a little later, I will argue also that trapping phenomena in random media is also where the Wiener sausage uh, is a tool to describe. Uh, spectral properties of random Schrodinger operators. So, in fact, in, in, the, in the paper where Marcatz Mar Mar introduced uh, the term Wiener sausage, he talks uh, about the, the, the role of Wiener sausage in understanding spectral properties of certain random Schrodinger equations. And he even talks about that the Wiener sausage plays a role in some very stylized models of, of uh, Bose Einstein uh, uh, condensation. So somehow it is, a, it is a tool. The Wiener sausage is not only an interesting object, it's a tool for other quantities. We're going to focus on two properties of the Wiener sausage. First, the volume of the Wiener sausage at time t, and then the capacity. I will explain on the next slide uh, why these two functionals of your Wiener sausage are, are interesting. And I'm only going to be talking about dimension greater than or equal to two because the one-dimensional Wiener sausage is not uninteresting, but it's, it's very simple, because, because uh, the Wiener sausage is just a random interval. And so you can compute everything by hand, and there, there, there's nothing really uh, very challenging in understanding the Wiener sausage uh, in dimension one. So I'm in, 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 in these talks, I'm not going to talk about one dimension at all. Okay, why are volume and capacity interesting? For instance, the volume plays a role in trapping phenomena. If, if I take a Poisson point process on RD uh, with a certain intensity, let's say alpha, positive and finite, and then around each of these points I draw a ball of radius one, then the probability that the Brownian motion will not hit any of the balls around this Poisson process up to time t. So this is, a, let's say, a survival probability for a Brownian motion that has to move its way around in this Poisson field of unit disks will exactly be e to the minus alpha times the volume because the the, the Wiener sausage traces out this volume and the Brownian motion will not hit the disk if and only if there is no Poisson point in the Wiener sausage. And the probability that there will be a Poisson point in the Wiener sausage is this thing here. And this is true for any realization of the Brownian motion. So, for instance, if I want to know what is the survival probability if I also average over the Brownian motion and not only over the Poisson points, then I get the expected value of the volume of the Wiener sausage. So you get uh, an object of which clearly, if you want to understand what that's doing for large t, you need to know about the large deviations of the volume. Because this will, be, will become some moment generating function of, uh, of the volume, and, and the behavior of the moment generating function depends on large deviation properties. So here uh, you already see a pre-announcement why large deviations of the, wien, of the volume of the Wiener sausage are important. The capacity, and uh, I will give a, a, a variational description of that in a second, plays a role in hitting phenomena. So suppose I have my Wiener sausage here, which is built on top of a Brownian motion, which I called beta. Suppose 
I now consider another Brownian motion. I call it auxiliary Brownian motion, and I denote it by beta bar. I can ask myself, what is the probability that this auxiliary Brownian motion hits the Wiener sausage? So I'm having my Wiener sausage in space, and I'm having some other Brownian motion, which I call beta bar, and I'm asking, what is the probability that starting from a certain point x, this auxiliary Brownian motion is going to hit my Wiener sausage, which is lying there in space. And capacity comes up when you want to understand how this behaves for very large x. So I'm an auxiliary Brownian motion, I'm starting at x, I see my Wiener sausage very far out lying there, a Wiener sausage of time length t, and I start moving and I say, what's the probability that I will ever get there? And in dimensions greater than or equal to three, that uh, th this, should have been a, this should have been a p, I'm sorry, not an e. Uh, so the probability that starting from a point x far out, I will hit the Wiener sausage if it scales like one over the distance to the origin of d minus two, and the limit is the capacity divided by a standard constant, which is the capacity of the unit ball. Yeah. Uh, uh, capacity, I will define it in, 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 in seconds. So capacity, well, you, you, uh, the capacity, you could define it here. You could say, uh, I take a set. Here I took for the set the Wiener sausage. If you put an arbitrary set here and you replace this by the, cap the capacity of that set, then you have your definition also of, uh, of the, the ca ca capacity, or if you, say, if you wish, a property of capacity. But I will define the capacity in a second. It's basically an object that comes from, from uh, electrostatics. Yeah, but you see here the Wiener sausage is just some, it's located somewhere in space, and if I, if I take the limit x going to infinity, I won't even see whether it's at the origin or next to the origin. Uh, I'm doing this for a finite t, and, uh, and this limit is also an almost sure uh, limit. So as very far away from the Wiener sausage, because this is a far away limit, you, you, uh, this does not depend where exactly the Wiener sausage started. You may imagine this starting at the origin. Going yeah. So if I just look at the difference coordinate, that's another Wiener sausage, uh, which no. is a fixed point. No? no. 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 It's not another Wiener sausage. And and here you you must run, uh, you must run your Wiener sausages for a fixed time t, keep it fixed, and then start. You, you cannot do it together. Yeah, then okay. then then it's another oh, okay. uh, it's another problem. And the difference is not uh, it's yeah. not a Wiener sausage of the difference. So it's not that both. No. Are, no. No. You cannot do. That's again coming from the spatial extendedness. This is expectation with respect to the auxiliary Brownian motion. It should be a P. Yeah, the right center is random because I'm trying to hit a random set. So the probability that my auxiliary Brownian motion hits this random set will still depend on this random set. So that's why I should have actually put here this is true almost surely with respect to, to the Wiener sausage. The first one, uh, I would take an, this is also a statement for just the, the, the fixed beta, and if you want me to take the expectation over beta as well, then, then I could do that, I could that, do that here too. I could say what's the probability that if I average over both the auxiliary Brownian motion and the ordinary Brownian motion, then I would have to put an expectation over this capacity with the expectation with respect to the Wiener sausage, so it would be an E without the bar. I mean, I'm using the beta to generate my Wiener sausage, and then I can ask all sorts of questions about the Wiener sausage. One of them could be, is there, what if it happens if I take another Brownian motion and it wants to hit this object? Okay, and there are other uh, examples uh, and, and which I mentioned before where you will see that volume and capacity of the Wiener sausage enter into the game. <laughs>
For instance, you can ask uh, other questions like the perimeter. You could say, I'm having between a sausage, what is, uh, what is the surface of this object? Or you could say, what, what is the, uh, the smallest bowl into which I can fit my Wiener sausage? Or you could put a uniform mass on the Wiener sausage and ask what would be its, uh, its moment of, uh, of inertia. You could ask something like, I start another auxiliary Brownian motion inside the Wiener sausage, how long does it take before it comes out of the Wiener sausage? And that would be controlled by the principal Dirichlet eigenvalue on the Wiener sausage. I could talk about heat content of the Wiener sausage. I could say I start by giving every point in the, uh, in the Wiener sausage temperature one, outside is temperature zero, heat starts to flow out, the, the Wiener sausage will cool down, eventually it will reach temperature zero because the, the heat will flow out into RD. Uh, and how does that happen? So how does the heat content decrease over time t. Or I might make the outside of the Wiener sausage have temperature one, the Wiener sausage temperature zero, and how would then the Wiener sausage be heating up? There are other quantities called torsional rigidity of the Wiener sausage. So this is a quantity where you say, take your Wiener sausage, randomly throw in an auxiliary Brownian motion, what is the average time until this Brownian motion exits the Wiener sausage? And it turns out that that quantity is important if you want to understand a property called torsional rigidity. And torsional rigidity is something about if you try to twist an object, how much force do you have to apply to really deform it? I, I will not go into that because there's a whole discussion behind that, but this, this is another interesting feature of random sets that you can uh, ask about. So there is a lot more out there, but uh, I, I, I will only focus, focus on the volume and the capacity of the Wiener sausage, and I still owe you a definition of the capacity. Now, all these quantities are, uh, have been looked at in the literature and they're interesting. Very often these quantities have something to do with certain isoparametric inequalities where uh, if you uh, look at these quantities for arbitrary sets, they become either maximal or minimal when the set is all. And to understand these quantities for a random set that is generated in a sausage, is interesting because of the application to the problem that I was describing before. Okay, so in, in the remainder of this lecture, I'm first going to recall a few basic facts, in particular uh, laws of large numbers and central limit theorems for the volume and for the capacity of the Wiener sausage and tell you what uh, has been going on and what is going on. And after that, I'll, I'll, I'll completely focus on large deviation principles for these two quantities. And <coughs> we will see that not only is dimension uh, uh, an interesting matter, obviously, as, as in uh, most, uh, most probabilistic problems, but for the large deviation principle, there will actually be something really remarkable happening in the dimension. But you will have to be patient uh, to, uh, to wait for that. Way we will actually see Wiener sausages with other radii as well. So by Brownian scaling, you can always space and time scaling and, and transfer results uh, to other radii. Okay. So let's first focus on the volume. We're going to be with the volume for a while and I'll get to the, to the capacity uh, only later. Spitzer was the very first person to prove something important about the Wiener sausage uh, in dimension three 
or higher, and that is that the volume of the Wiener sausage grows linearly. And that is quite intuitive. You have a Brownian motion that is transient, so it keeps on exploring new space all the time. And the fact that the volume would therefore be growing linearly in time is quite uh, intuitive. So it's the capacity of the ball that the Wiener sausage is carrying with it, and this uh, is is uh, is a uh, is a standard constant that you can compute in terms of the gamma function. So uh, is, is very classical. This is a very classical fact. I will give you a definition of of capacity. Second, I have already told you that capacity is a proportionality constant in how what the probability is that you will hit a far away object, but also has an intrinsic uh, the, the, uh, description in terms of electrostatic. Uh, now, the fact that this limit exists is not hard because, uh, because of the subadditivity property of volume. If you take two uh, sets, A and B, then the volume of the union is smaller uh, and equal to the <coughs> sum of the volumes. And if I apply this set where uh, to, uh, to, 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 to the set um, sausage as a function of time, it means that volume is a sub-additive random process and therefore the limit exists. And the limit will also be finite because of the sub-additivity. You have to do a little work to prove that the limit is positive and in fact even to identify it as this number, and that is what, uh, what, uh, what, sir. And you, you need a bit of potential theory to actually compute this limit. So this was, in some sense, one of the oldest and earliest results about, uh, about the Wiener sausage, and quite a, uh, quite a nice one. Now, the case of two dimensions is cool because now uh, you become critically current. And as a result, the, the volume in two dimensions is not quite going to grow linearly. It's going to grow a little less, t over log t, so that if you multiply by log t over t, you will get a number, which will be the capacity of the unit ball in two dimensions. But capacity in two dimensions has to be defined a little bit differently. And this number actually turns out to be very simple. It's 4 pi. So here, because the Wiener sausage has a tendency to come back before, it will grow a little less than linear, and everything can be, can be uh, dealt with in detail. There's also a central limit theorem. You can prove that the variance of the volume of the Wiener sausage has this behavior in dimensions 2, 3, and greater than or equal to 4. So in dimensions 4, it's t. Uh, in dimension 3, it's a little more than t. And in dimension 2, it is a little less than t squared. And again, there is something also in one dimension, but I'm not going to talk about one dimension at all. And this was uh, proved also by Spitzer, except the two-dimensional case is more delicate, and uh, Legal uh, proved uh, this result here. And there, the, I mean, there, there's a certain constant in front of it that uh, that I don't bother to tell you what they are, but they are known. And in dimensions greater than or equal to three, the limit law is Gaussian. So if you scale by the the, the, the variance, you will end up with standard normal limit law, uh, but for two dimensions it's non-Gaussian, and uh, that limit law was also identified by uh, Legal, and it has something to do with, with, uh, with intersection of uh, local time. So the, so the limiting law for dimension two is known, but it's more complicated and requires a more sophisticated uh, description. So you see that <coughs> two dimensions is really a critical case <coughs> in which something rather a bit different is happening than in dimensions greater than or equal to three. This is no surprise because we, we know that uh, 
because of the difference between recurrence and transients. Yeah, it is the same. So this kind of behavior for a random walk okay. on the letters where T becomes N is the same. Let's change a bit because like the escape probably different. Okay, so let's go to capacity, and we're talking about something that should be called the Newtonian capacity, but I'm not going to carry this name along. And uh, there are different ways to define it, but here is a variational expression for it that uh, comes from electrostatics. If you want to compute one over the capacity, then this is given by a variational formula. Uh, any boils, then what I do, and I this double where I integrate over x and y according to this probability distribution that's living on the set A function, and this function is the standard Green's function in dimension D. This is for D greater than or equal to 3. Uh, and then when you take this minimum, then that is what is 1 over the capacity. So the way you should think of this is as you think of your set A as consisting of copper, and so it's a conductor, and on this set you place a unit charge, and these, the charge is repelling, so the, it, it tries to sort of cover this set in such a way that the charges are as far away from each other as possible. And then the, between volume elements dx and dy in your conductor, there is this, let's say, repulsive energy. So this is, this is like, uh, like Coulomb's law. Uh, and then this is to be thought of as the electrostatic energy that uh, this conductor A carries when I put a unit charge on it. And, and the infimum is taken because the charges try to configure themselves in such a way that this electric uh, energy is, is the lowest, and the number that you get is 1 over the capacity. So this is one way to define the capacity. There are, there are other ways, and I already told you about one that has to do with will I hit an object that is far away, then it's, it's also appearing, and there are many other, I would say many, but several others. This formula is, is the one for dimension uh, three or higher. If dimension is two, you have to replace this by, by a logarithmic uh, kernel, and this, this object was all, or this logarithmic object was also appearing in, in, in Francis's uh, talk, and so, the world is again a bit different in dimension two, but again something very similar to that is uh, is uh, is happening. So you may think of capacity as some kind of uh, yeah inverse per per unit charge that you on an object. Okay, and the reason why capacity plays a role in whether I hit an object very far has actually everything to do with this Green's function because this Green's function describes how Brownian motion moves around in space. Okay, so these are all very classical facts that you can find in any book on uh, on, on on potential theory, and so you you can you can uh, if you want to know more about this you can look in in. Okay. Also, the capacity satisfies a strong law of large numbers. So the capacity is also growing in dimensions greater than or equal to 5 uh, linearly in T. Uh, this was recently proved in a paper by Asala Shapira and uh, Susie. Uh, 
the the existence of the, 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 it, it's not difficult to get this proof. I will later uh, tell you a result that was quite a bit more difficult that they also proved, but. Um, it's going again linearly. Your, your, your Wiener sausage is, is growing linearly in, uh, in space, and therefore also the capacity should be going linearly in space. And there is a proportionality constant. Again, capacity is also a sub additive quantity, so the capacity of the union of two sets is less than or equal to the capacity of the sum of the sets you can actually immediately see this from this variational representation using the fact that this, the right-hand side here, is monotone in the distance. It's decreasing in the distance. So using that, you immediately, capacity is also like the volume is a sub-additive quantity. So therefore, if you apply to the Wiener sausage, this will be, the, the existence of the limit is no issue. The fact that the limit would be finite is also no issue, uh, but you have to do a bit of work to prove that the limit is strictly positive. And the problem that we are having at the moment is we do not have a closed form expression for this number. So unlike the, the, what we saw for, for the volume, we do not know how to compute this constant. And uh, I think it may be quite a difficult object to compute. Don't, I don't have any particular high hopes this should be easily computable, but it exists and you can get bounds on it, etc., etc. So a little difference is coming up already here. The limit is not so easy to identify, and this is four dimensions uh, five and half, and the reason and higher is important is that if you take two arms of the Wiener sausage, they will intersect finitely often uh, in dimension five or higher, and they will intersect infinitely often in dimensions four or lower, and that apparently uh, has an effect on what the Right, because the capacity is trying to charge us over the set, and then there's some inter uh, Coulomb interaction between the sets. So, so the capacity is a much less local object. It's a more global object because it, uh, it really depends on the whole set and the distances uh, between different parts of the set. Yes? So no matter what thing you have, you always have an optimal distribution. This is what we call the, you know, an equilibrium distribution of the charges. Okay, yeah. And, okay, so you see that the capacity already is a, is a somewhat more complicated object and, and it, it, uh, it, 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 the critical dimension is different, so let me mention that. This is a, re, a recent result by Astela Shapir and Susie, that the capacity in dimension four is growing a little less, less than linear, uh, namely t over log t. And here the limit can be computed because, uh, and, and it turns out to be eight pi squared. And uh, this was a somewhat delicate uh, uh, computation to actually get that, to get the power of log. So here for capacity it's dimension two. Sorry, for capacity, it's dimension four that is critical. Whereas for the volume, we saw that it was dimension two that was critical. And that has everything to do with the fact that the capacity is a much more global quantity than the volume. Okay, again, in, we do expect a central limit theorem to hold for the capacity. This has not been proved. They, in another paper, prove this, the, 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 let's say, the analog for the discrete random walk. So if you would look at simple random walk on the, the lattice rather than the Brownian motion, and you would look at its range rather than the Wiener sausage, then you can associate the capacity with that lattice. It's now a capacity living on the lattice. And then these things are, are true, at least in some dimensions they've proved this. 
So again, this is a very similar, this is the same variance as we saw it for, for the volume, but everything, the, all the dimensions have sort of shifted by two. And it is expected that again in these dimensions, five or higher, the limit law would be Gaussian, and it is expected that in the critical dimension, the limit law would not be Gaussian, but this has not been proved. In the continuum, nothing has been proved, and in the discrete thing, only part of what is written here uh, has been proved. For instance, uh, this has really only been proved up to you know uh, upper and lower bounds where the powers of the logarithm are, 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 are not matching, but so what is written here is what should be true, and, and only part of it has been, has been proved. So that's the setting for the capacity at this moment. Capacity is certainly interesting in dimension two and three. But we know even less about capacity in two and three than we know in dimensions four and higher. Uh, I decided not to talk about the capacity in those dimensions at all. But there, it's very interesting, and it would be certainly very interesting to understand in the minute two and three, it log t over over t, um, and and also the variance. I don't know what what to expect. And certainly for, for the large deviations that we're talking about, I have, I have really no, no idea. It seems to be really good. So here's an, here's an area where things are still on the, uh, on the move. OK. We're about halfway this lecture, and now it's time to go and talk about large deviations of the volume and the capacity, the two quantities that I've been talking about so far. And it turns out that large deviations of the volume and the capacity in the downward direction are easier to deal with than in the upward direction. So you can ask, what is the probability that the volume of the Wiener sausage would be half its mean? This we can deal with, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. If I would ask, what's the probability that it's three and a half times its mean? Uh, that's going to be much more costly. So the upward large deviations are much more costly than the large downward large deviations. Also in Francis's talk, he already mentioned, and we've seen other examples uh, in the last couple of weeks that deviations in, in different directions may, may be very different. And so this, ha this happens. Uh, um, quite often, and also here, downward leads deviations are different than upward leads to large deviations. I will talk about the upward large deviations a little bit uh, later, but not, not now. And so here is, the, here is a downward LDP, large deviation principle, for the volume. I take any number B positive, the really interesting values of B would be the ones that are less than, than kappa D, because the volume is growing like kappa DT, so the, the values B less than kappa D are the really interesting ones. Now, the probability that, uh, that the volume will be below BT, and so if B would be half the capacity of the unit ball, then this would be saying, what's the probability that your volume is less than half its mean, is going to go down like a stretched exponential. And the stretched exponential has exponent d minus 2 over d. So it doesn't cost you exponentially, but stretched exponential. Here is, this theorem is for dimensions th 3 or higher. I will state the, the same theory in the critical, same theorem in the critical dimension 2 a little later. And this, the rate function uh, here, is, so it's a downward rate function, it depends on the dimension d, and it depends on, on the b that I'm putting in here, has a variational formula. It is the, uh, it's the gradient of a function phi integrated out over d, so this is 
what is the Dirichlet form associated with the Brown emotion. And I'm supposed to vary this phi over a certain set. And the set is written down here. It's the set of all functions that are for which both the Laplacian, both the function phi and the, 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 the gradient of phi are square integrable. The phi has to be square integrable with, uh, with um, norm one. And there is a certain constraint where this b appears here that is over there, namely a certain integral of your test function here has to be less than this threshold b that I'm talking about. So here is the b dependence coming in. This part does not depend on the b. Here is some functional that you need to minimize. Here is a class of functions uh, that, uh, that you need to minimize. And here is the constraint. And the constraint involves both the b and the number kd that would be the, 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 for which if b would be kappa, this would be just typical, right? Because of the law of large numbers. And so here is an explicit variational formula where this rate function is identified. In the lecture tomorrow, I will go through an argument why this large deviation principle is true and where this exponent comes from, where this function that you have to minimize comes from, and where this set over which you have to minimize, which depends on the parameter b here, comes from. So that will, I will explain that. Uh, uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> At this moment, it's, uh, I just state it as a result. And <clears throat> the idea really is the following behind the proof. So if your wheat sausage wants to be small, let's say it wants to be half of its average value, then what would the Brownian motion do in order to realize that large deviation? It would say, I'm going to shrink myself a bit. I'm going to uh, not explore a space like I typically do and, and find a, a volume kappa dt. I'm going to sort of uh, lock myself up on a somewhat smaller scale. And it turns out that what the Brownian motion will do is that it will, it will follow a strategy where it has a drift towards the origin that is given by uh, a test function, and this is the test function over which you have to optimize in your variational formula. And the drift of the Brownian motion will be following this profile phi on scale t to the 1 over d. Now, on that scale, uh, boxes have volume t. And, and we're looking at large deviations of the Wiener sausage of order t. So this is the right scale for the Brown emotion to live on in order to have uh, a volume T. Then what happens if the Brown emotion behaves like a Brown emotion with this drift on this large scale? So this drift is only slowly varying on that scale according to a profile phi. Then the cost of that will be exactly the cost that we see in our variational formula. And what happens is that when the Brownian motion does that, so when it behaves like a Brownian motion in a drift field that varies on scale t to the 1 over d, you will see that if you take a little volume element dx, the time that it will spend into this volume element will be t times phi squared x. And the Wiener sausage will cover this fraction of that volume element. I'm taking a volume in, small volume element on scale t to the 1 over d. I say, if you do this strategy, how much time will you spend in that volume element? And the, the time is proportional to t, and it will be phi squared x dx, where phi is this function here. And if I look at that volume element, I say, how much volume of the Wiener sausage is now in that volume element? And that is given by this fraction. So I will have to argue tomorrow why that is true. Now, if I do that, I have 
parametrized, uh, so this parametrizes a whole bunch of strategies. It will produce the right cost, depending on phi. The total volume, of, the total time that I can spend is, has to be one, so phi squared x dx has to integrate up to one. So that was this constraint here. If I integrate over the volume element the fraction, I should get the total Wiener sausage volume, uh, uh, sorry, and that is exactly this constraint, because I want that my strategy produces a volume that is not more than B. So the strategy that I can use has to satisfy this constraint, otherwise it would create a volume that would overshoot this BT. And then the statement says this, it says, okay, you vary over all imaginable phi's that you can do, that you can have, and do, when you do this strategy, you actually get the real rate function. So one thing that you have to prove is that there isn't anything else that you can do that will be doing better. This strategy is the best strategy to do it, and out of the variational formula selects the phi that is among all those even the best one. That, that, that is uh, what is happening. And this fits the, the slogan of large deviation. You do something unlikely in the least unlikely of all the unlikely ways. That's a lovely way to say things. Yes? You know, that exactly understand what it means that the motion It means that I'm going to not, I, I'm going to, I, I'm going to run my brown motion as, it's, as if it's in a drift field. So when I do that, there is a Gersanus form that, that gives me how much the cost of that Brownian motion would be with respect to my original Brownian motion. And what I do is that I make my, I pick a phi, and at the point x, t to the 1 over d, that's the scale, I will give the Brownian motion a drift, uh, lambda phi divided by phi. And if I, that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I have originally a Brownian motion that has no drift. I then say, let me, suppose that I let my Brownian motion behave as, it, as if it were a Brownian motion in this drift field. Then how much does that cost? And that cost is exactly the thing here, and that is what, what's, giving, what's coming into your variational formula. Okay. Great. So what we see is that actually the, 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 the optimal strategy for the, for the Wiener sausage is to, to be basically behaving like, like a twist speed. So there is a time scale, space scale, t to the 1 over d. And I, I, I basically see that this thing is, is, is doing something something like this, and there are all sorts of holes in here. Uh, and, uh, and what you see if I take a point x, t to the 1 over d, I see that the local, uh, local fraction covered is e to the minus kappa phi squared x, and, and th this actually goes on everywhere here, uh, but it's, it's all controlled, so, 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 so there is a control function in the background, which says this is what you see when you run a Brownian motion with a certain drift. And the Wiener sausage does not cover everything. There are, there are random holes inside here, and that's why we call this the uh, Swiss cheese strategy. So the optimal strategy to reduce your volume, let's say by a factor of a half, for large time is that you're going to collapse down to a much smaller space scale, t to the 1 over d, which is much less than square root of t. And on that scale, you will start to walk around like a, a Brownian motion with a certain optimal drift. And when you do that, 
you will see that you will have a kind of spongy uh, structure of your set with random holes and, and a locally varying density on this scale t to the 1 over d. And this is all controlled by this test function phi. And then in the variational formula, you're supposed to optimize over this phi. OK, so I'm going to explain to you next week where that comes from. But it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting strategy. In dimension two, uh, things look the same, but the scale is different. The scale is now logarithm t. So it means, and, and you have to look at volumes below a constant times uh, t over log t, uh, because that was the, the average scale in the critical dimension, so a little bit smaller. And it now turns out that if you want to uh, do large deviations on the scale of your mean, so you want to go, let's say, uh, uh, f of your average volume, then the cost is polynomial. And the exponent of the polynom polynomial is given by this rate function here. And the rate function is exactly the same as we had before. Uh, again, this thing to be managed, minimized over a set of test functions. So this should be 2 instead of 4, because we're living in R2 now. And again, the same variational formula where there's a parameter b coming from this here that you say in your Swiss strategy, you do want the total volume of this object here to be matching your b. And the kappa 2 is the kappa 2 as we know it, which is 4 pi. So same <coughs> variational formula, but a different scale. And it turns out that the, the scale uh, in so this was the scale for d greater than equal to 3, and for d equal to 2, the, the scale is square root of t over log t. So you're, you're slightly below the diffusive scale, and this is still slightly below the diffusive scale. OK, so the cost of the downward large deviations in the critical dimension is less. Uh, it is polynomial rather than, uh, than, than stretched exponential. So again, the, 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 the criticality of the dimension really changes also the large deviation picture significantly. OK, now, what can we say about these weight functions? I, I want to spend. Uh, a, a little time on that and show you some pictures. I can, by using Brownian scaling, scale the rate function to a function where all the constants have disappeared, right? So here there, there, there was a, a kappa 2, there's a b here, there's a, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and what I can do by Brownian scaling is to bring the rate function in a standardized form where it is, apart from a normalization that depends on this constant kappa d, and also in the argument, it is given by a standardized formula where there are no constants left anymore except dimension. And so, so this variational formula is you have to minimize the L2 norm of the gradient of psi. Psi has to be square integrable and also the gradient has to be square integrable. This, the square norm has to be 1 and this integral has to be uh, bounded by this scaled variable, which now starts to become interesting for u between 0 and 1. I do allow u to be positive, but you will see that this whole variational formula will collapse when u gets larger than 1. Because this integral can never be more than 1. This function here, uh, we, we know a number of facts about it. It's a continuous function. It's strictly decreasing. It's really non-decreasing because if this goes up, the constraint gets less, so this goes down. And it becomes zero as you hit the point one. We also know that if a minimizer exists, and sometimes the minimizer does exist, sometimes not, if it exists, it's unique modular translations. And you can use things like uh, what are called uh, uh, rearrangement inequalities uh, 
uh, for the Laplacian to show that it would also be uh, the minimizer. Uh, if you center it, it will be radially symmetric and radially decreasing. So we know a lot about this variational formula. And I'm going to show you uh, a few pictures in the next slide. But for instance, one thing we know is that if, if I make u go to zero, so now I'm asking for large deviations that are really small on the scale of the mean. So I'm asking what is the large, the, the, the cost of a large deviation that is really a, a, a very small number u times the mean. Then that cost will <coughs> will uh, blow up, and the blow up will be exactly given by, so it turns out, the Dirichlet eigenvalue of minus the Laplacian on the unit ball. So we know the asymptotics. And so this fact that we see in our rate functions corresponds to the question that you say, what happens if the Wiener sausage does such a severe large deviation that is no longer even living on the scale of its mean. And it happens that then what happens is that this, the volume of this thing has to shrink even more, so it's like I'm pressing this Swiss cheese and I'm pressing all the, all the holes out. And in that limit, you will see that this cheesy object will converge to a compact ball. If I, if I want this volume to be so small that it's even going to be uh, much smaller than, uh, than, than, than this scale, I'm going to basically squeeze out the holes and I'm going to end up with a ball. So this is a Gouda cheese, <coughs> which <coughs> is perfectly circular. You won't find them in, in Dutch shops, only because they're always flat a little bit at the top at the bottom. <coughs> and then actually we find back some earlier work that had been done about much more extreme large deviations of the Wiener sausage. Uh, there was a paper by Donske Varden about, about uh, um, exponential moments of the Wiener sausage uh, as an application of their theory of large deviation uh, principle for Markov chains. And then uh, the Donske Varden regime actually went way be below this. And then Bolthausen and Snigman were, were able to sort of crank this up to any little O of ET. But it was clear that their method had to stop there because, um, uh, because uh, there is a different strategy for doing large deviations on the scale of the mean. So, so this scaling result, which just comes out of analyzing this variational formula, is recovering, in some sense, these, these earlier results where people were looking at really extreme uh, large deviations of the volume of the Wiener sausage. OK, now here are pictures of this standardized rate function. And there is something really interesting happening at dimensions five or higher. So we have one large deviation principle for dimensions three or higher, where the cost is stretched exponential, the d minus over d, and we have a large deviation rate function, the critical dimension, the cost growth mix, or the cost was polynomial. And it turns out that in dimension, so they are, they are strictly decreasing curves, they hit one, and then they become zero. That's because if you ask for a large deviation, something that is higher than the mean, it, it, it doesn't cost you anything. So the rate function should become zero uh, above one, and they do. Now, in two dimensions, this is a nice convex curve. In dimension three, it's not. And the, convex, the non-convexity means that there are uh, if you look at certain moment generating functions, there is actually a collapse transition uh, 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 occurring. And so the non-convexity has some, some um, effect on questions uh, that deal with trapping um, of, of Brownian motion in a, in a, in a Poisson field of disks. So this is one of the applications that I mentioned of the Wiener sausage. But in dimensions five or higher, 
there's even <laughs> something much more remarkable happening. There is a number, a critical value between zero and one, at which this curve is non-analytic. And what is happening here is that if I ask for a deviation downwards below I'm going to do this Swiss cheese strategy all the time. I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this all the way up to time t. If, however, I am here, so this means I want the volume to be lower than the mean, but not so much, let's say 90%. Then what happens is that this Swiss strategy is actually done only part of the time. So what will happen is that the optimal strategy will be for your Brownian motion to do this for, let's say, half of the time, and then to sort of shoot off and be a usual Brownian motion. And this fraction of the time, it will create uh, a volume that is proportional to this time times kappa d. And here, it will produce another fraction of the time, and the two together produce exactly the large deviation that you want. So in dimension five, something really uh, remarkable is happening that you push the large deviation down, you will start to see that there is a little Swiss cheese uh, appearing, and there's still a certain part of the Wiener Sorge that does the typical thing. But when I this volume to become too small, this thing has been completely absorbed into the Swiss cheese. And so the, in this case, there is an inhomogeneous strategy. You do typical stuff part of the time, and you do large deviation stuff another part of the time. And this you can do because we're looking at large deviations on the time scale, on the scale of the mean. This is not happening in dimensions three and four, and, and it's, a, it's a deep thing that is hidden in this variational formula. And it has something to do with uh, uh, developing this up to uh, you know, the, the, the fourth and the sixth power and, and using uh, uh, Sobolev inequalities. And, and it's, it's, it, it's something that is not lying on the surface. And we were a bit surprised at the time to find this. So that is how you should interpret this thing here. And along this here, the, the, the curve is, is, uh, takes a much easier form. It's some kind of pure power law as a function of 1 minus u, whereas here it, it becomes uh, something different. It's like when you try to do this strategy for a while, you're fine, but then uh, the, 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 at some point the, the full Swiss strategy is managing to do better. Okay. Now, one word of, of caution. I have always been talking about interpreting the large division formula in terms of such strategies. And that is really what is happening. But I'm not claiming that we have proved that conditional on the large deviation principle, this is really what the path is doing. I could prove this in a kind of weak sense. If I'm only talking about volumes and times, the answer is yes. But we have not proved that conditional on the large deviation principle, the path is really following all over the time in some nice norm. This uh, this Brownian motion with the drift. Um, I'm sure this is true, but this will require a bit more work. You would have to go and, and worry about errors in your large deviation principle. Uh, Francis already mentioned that, you know, if you compute rate functions, there are strategies behind, but proving that the strategies are really realized conditional on a large deviation event is another level of complication. We're, I'm not going to go into that, but certainly in in a kind of soft sense, what the, the strategies that I've been told, told you to think about are really ones 
that are happening. So one can prove it in sort of in some kind of soft topology that this is happening. Okay, something really interesting here happening in dimension five or higher. Oh. Uh, in the I still have 15 minutes to go, so let me very briefly mention that what is known about short large deviation. So if you want the, the V to be larger than uh, as, uh, on the scale T, again dimension 3, there is also associated with it a rate function. So Hamana and Keston proved that this rate function exists, and they also proved that this rate function becomes larger than zero when b is larger than the typical value, which was this kappa d. So this function will be zero below kappa d and positive above kappa d. So just like the opposite from what we had for the downward large deviations. The cost is exponential. So it's much more costly to make a large deviation in the upward direction. And why is that? If you want to have a small large deviation volume, you simply confine your Brownian motion to a somewhat smaller scale, and that is not so costly. It's costly, but, but not exponentially costly. If you want the volume to be large, what you have to do is everywhere along the typical path stretch the Brownian motion a little bit up, inflate it a bit more so that the whole volume gets larger. I can make the volume smaller by, by making it intersect itself more, but to make it larger I have to everywhere sort of squeeze, uh, inflate the Brownian motion, and that's costly, and that is exponentially. And there's no variational formula known function. We cannot write down anything reasonable. I, 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 it's certainly, so, so, so with Erwin and Michiel, we wrote down some kind of horrific variational problem enormous space of all stationary ergodic processes, and, 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 but, but th 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 this, is not, this is not useful at all. So there is some very high level, very abstract variational formula for this, but it's useless to be able to, to get what the properties are, and it should be some function that goes up, but we don't know much about this. There are some bounds known for this object. There was earlier work on understanding exponential moments of this VT, uh, and if you use that, you can get some control over it. more difficult to get your hands on than the downward large deviation principle, for which we have nice variational formulas. So let's see what we have for past. In, in the next 10 minutes, I will write down what the analogous large deviation principles are for the capacity. The critical dimension for capacity is four, so this large deviation principle applies only for dimensions five or higher, and, and this is what I write down here is work in, in progress with uh, Erwin and, uh, and Michiel. For the capacity to be making a downward large deviation, again uh, on the scale t at which it's living typically in dimension five or higher, um, and take a b here, I get a different exponent. The exponent is d minus 4 over d minus 2. So it's again stress exponential, but with a different exponent. And you see that dimension 4 is critical in, uh, for, for this result. There's again, you have to minimize this kind of integral, as we saw before, under a constraint. And the constraint is different in the way you have to deal with the, uh, the, the constraint B because it's no longer an integral like 1 minus kappa D to the phi squared dx. It is a more complicated thing in which this constant CD, which is the constant for the typical growth, so the capacity typically grows like CDT, has to be modulated by a certain function um, here. And this function you have to solve first it is the solution of the Schrodinger with the potential uh, CD times phi squared, phi is your test function, times a certain constant, and the constant is written down here. And you have to solve this Schrodinger equation with uh, 
uh, boundary condition one at infinity. So if for a given test function you first solve this function, you find it and then you have to substitute this into your integral and then you have to satisfy this constraint. So upshot of the story is there is again a variational formula, a bit of the same type. It's again built on some kind of strategy where you say, okay, I'm going to give my Brownian motion a drift towards the origin, and that should be, uh, that drift is modulated by a test function, and that should be an optimal strategy. However, the whole space scale is different. It is not going to be uh, t to the 1 over d, but it's going to be something different. And the cost will then be this integral times some different scaling. So the whole scaling uh, here is different. I'm no longer living on the same scale, I'm living on another scale. And the constraint is a bit more complicated because the capacity is a non-local quantity and I apparently have to, in the constraint, get a function that depends on the phi function in a way that still first requires that you solve a Schrodinger equation with potential that is proportional to the square of your test function. <clears throat> and there is a certain constant appearing in here. Now I've put here a red exclamation mark because I'm not 100% sure about this constant. There is some constant, but I, I, it, 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 it may turn out to be a bit different. Uh, this is work in progress. Uh, at the moment, we think that it's this number, but, but we are, there's a little lamp burning in the back of our head saying maybe, maybe this should be a, a somewhat different constant. I, I won't go into this. Uh, that's, that's what we are able to do. I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced that the result this would be true, but I, we only have a little bit of doubt about whether this is the right constant. I, I, I have hope that this would be okay. Okay, so uh, same sort of variational problem, but with a much more difficult constraint that actually involves you having to solve first the Schrodinger equation associated with the square of your test function, and then it is sort of similar in spirit. You try to behave like a random walk, uh, like a Brownian motion with a drift, but the scales are all different. The space scales are different, and scales are, are, are different. In fact, you will now want to vary your drift on a scale t to the 1 over d minus 2 rather than t to the 1 over d. And this is a much bigger scale. So your, your Wiener sausage is not filling space, it's really much more dilute. And when you do that, the same calculation will give you that the cost of that strategy will produce what you want, and you will, uh, you will have to see then uh, what actually the capacity of such a, an object is, and it turns out to produce something that depends on the Schrodinger equation. Because the Schrodinger equation is also something that uh, comes up when you uh, want to understand capacity. So because the constraint that you have to match is a constraint on the capacity, there is a more complicated object as a function of your test function that you have to control. And that's where this, uh, where this uh, Schrodinger equation comes from. So uh, I will hope to give you some hints tomorrow about what that is. Okay, and basically, the, it, it turns out that this thing here has something to do with the probability that if I start an auxiliary Brownian motion in this uh, dilute Wiener sausage, that you say, what is the probability that you will be able to get out of it? It's a number between zero and one, and this U phi, U phi has something to do with if you have a Brownian motion that follows this scale drift, it creates some kind of Wiener sausage, if I start somewhere in the middle, what is the probability that I can escape to infinity without ever hitting that Brownian mode? Maybe I'll get to, to that uh, tomorrow. So here, 
the optimal strategy is not a Swiss cheese. There are much bigger holes in the strategy because you are basically going to be a Wiener sausage that lives on a scale t to the 1 over d minus 2. That scale is much bigger than the scale of the volume. And uh, uh, the, 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 it's much bigger than a box of volume t. And uh, that is the strategy somehow to lower your capacity because if you want to make a capacity small, you, you want the, the set to be far from each other because then you will lower the the uh, electrostatic energy. So, so that is what is happening, very different from what we see for the volume. And <clears throat> uh, in four dimensions, same story, uh, now no longer stretch exponential but logarithmically, I have to look at deviations on the scale of the, the mean, which uh, we know is now t over log t in dimension four, and it's a similar problem where, again, the same kind of constraint uh, uh, appears. And uh, again, you have to solve for that uh, a Schrodinger e equation, uh, again, with, uh, with the same uh, similar objects, but now in dimension four. And again, the cost of the large deviations in the critical dimension is polynomial rather than stretched exponential. So that is reflecting what we saw for the volume, except the critical dimension is now four rather than two. So different scales, different critical dimensions, certain similarities, but the capacity has a more complicated variable formula. I want to say my last word when this thing rings, so I'm, I'm looking carefully. Paul. Okay, and I can standardize this form and so I, I can write it down in a standard way in which all the constants A, D, and C, D have sort of disappeared. And we are currently trying to analyze this object, and it is really a much more complicated thing. We have not yet been able to <coughs> derive uh, pictures as I showed you for the large deviation rate function for the volume, where there, there, were, there was dimension two, there was dimension three and four, and then five and higher had, had, had a non analyticity point and non homogeneous strategies. We are not there yet to understand what <coughs> this standard variational formula does, and the, and the whole reason is that here you first have to solve the Schrodinger equation. So this is a more delicate object. It will require more uh, delicate applications of Sobolev inequalities, and we're right in the middle of, of trying to, to derive it. And, uh, and let me be honest, until we have done it, uh, you know, we don't have a result. We're, we're, we're not sure uh, about this. But, but we're pretty confident that what's happening here is, uh, is the right thing. Again, we would expect that upward large deviation should be exponentially costly. No result known whatsoever. There is no analog of the hamana keston result for, for the capacity. It's all open. You can get some, some bounds, some crude bounds, but uh, is, is there a large deviation principle? Can you at least prove that there is a rate function? We don't know. Dimension two and three, we don't know much at all. There are some results about mean and variance, but, but very rough. So let me uh, summarize, and I want to stop it when this rings. I gave you a sketch of laws of large numbers, central limit theorems, large deviation principles for the volume and the capacity. They're very different. Volume is a very local quantity. Capacity is a very global quantity. For the volume, we've got nice formulas. For the capacity, we also have formulas, but we, we still haven't really proved them. And they're also much more complicated uh, as an object. So tomorrow, I will try to explain to you where these large deviations principles are coming from. OK. Works.
Yeah. Uh, in in all the constraints where you have an inequality on the in the second uh, integral, um, do you expect it to be realized to be saturated for the optimal? Yeah. Um, so for the volume, we actually know that, okay. and and that comes because. In, in the end, when you've done the analysis, the rate functions are strictly decreasing. So in, in the region where it's... A, so indeed, yes, it will be saturated. For the capacity, we also think that they should be strictly decreasing. And then again, they... In the, for example, going back to the law of large numbers for volume, if instead of this uh, inner source, you put a different shape around, the, uh, around your point... Yeah. Uh, you get... Uh, yeah. No, no problem. Um, for if you would re replace the unit ball by any compact set, um, everything carries over. We have done it for the volume uh, only, uh, and what happens is that the constant kappa d has to be replaced by the capacity of your set, and. Uh, so for for compact sets, there should be no problem. Even you could even dream that it could be some fractal set that you carry around, and then it's probably still okay. But you you do need some reasonable properties about the set because of certain approximation uh, properties. In the proof, you will you will have to do various approximations. And so let's say the net's nice, but in, indeed you can carry around a set, a square, no nope. Gouda cheese. Emmentaler with holes in it. It's also fine. Can you explain to us uh, the large addition for the capacity? Uh, so the capacity is one example of uh, global quantity you are, you are interested in. <coughs> Look at the so such. Uh, now uh, there are other quantities. So, uh, question is, uh, do you expect to have such a structure for the rate function that is in fee, uh, minimizing a uh, H1 norm <coughs> on the test function, but the constraint, of course, will depend yeah. on the kind of global quantity that you are looking at? Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, for instance, one thing we would like to do is to look at the large deviation of the torsional rigidity. So this is another quantity. It would be you 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 you, you integrate over all points in your Wiener sausage uh, uh, Brownian motion auxiliary Brownian motion that starts there, and say what's the expected time until you will leave the Wiener sausage. Um, and uh, that's an interesting quantity. It has lots of properties that are similar to volume and capacity. We expect that this will satisfy a large deviation principle. We haven't done it. Uh, I. I think one can be optimistic here and say that the method for downward large deviation should be quite robust. At the same time, um, if you see some of the difficulties that, that we now deal with with the capacity, you, uh, the, 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 there are challenges there. Each quantity will have its own critical dimension, and then uh, the way you go about dealing with this will, will may have subtleties that for some quantities are much harder than for other quantities. I mean, the capacity is really a step up in difficulty. Uh, but let's say roughly, I, I think uh, the answer to your question would be yes. So in, in what sense? Uh, in some sense, because uh, things should also depend on the dimension, depending on the object yeah. considering, you may expect to have a classification of those uh, global quantities in a final yeah. way yeah. using large deviations. Yeah. yeah, so we have now only classified two objects, and uh, let's hope, but, but uh, you know, you're right, uh, the sky is the limit. And, uh, and uh, the, so you will have critical dimensions in, for every object. You, you, a priori, you have different space time scales uh, to deal with for different objects, but they, they should have something in common, and that's this, this kind of uh, Swiss uh, spaghetti kind of object. So, uh, so, so there, there is something more general out there. Ah, that's another, that's another quantity. Uh, the, the, the surface of the yeah. Uh, so, Abla uh, and Shapiro and um, Susie have. A result about the area of the Javran and or of large numbers and central limit theorems for for that. Um, 
it, it, it's a bit more difficult. A quantity of which you 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 would be able to fit into this picture, but you would have to do the work and see what the variational problem becomes. You you will get a more co a different constraint.